All right, let's try and get some analysis now. Uh, both the Western Cape and KwaZulu Natal have been experiencing uh, very extreme weather patterns in recent days. University of KwaZulu Natal's climate change professor is Tafadzwa Mabaudi, who joins us now for more on the country's ability to respond to uh, such extreme weather patterns. Professor, good evening to you and uh, thank you very much for your time. I want to start the conversation with um, what is being experienced in KwaZulu Natal and in the main, it's the wildfires. The assumption right now is that these are man-made. The uh, suspicion is that this could be the work of poachers who are trying to drive animals uh, to a particular route so that they can uh, take them away. But let's talk to the very dry temperatures. Do those make it easy then for someone who starts a fire, for that fire to catch on and you basically unable to gain control of it? Yeah, indeed. So we've, we're coming from a dry uh, summer season where we had uh, below average rainfall. So naturally it means the soil itself is a little bit drier than average. And we've got a lot of dry vegetation, dry grass, dry trees, shedding leaves. So the fuel load then is high. Mm. So if you start a fire and already, you know, the weather systems that are happening in Cape Town, they move across the country coming up into KwaZulu Natal. So those strong winds also then add to that situation. So you've got a high fuel load, strong winds. If you start a fire, it's very easy for you to lose control of that fire. Yeah. Before we talk about the rough seas that we saw then in Cape Town that the president spoke about a little earlier, uh, someone says uh, global temperatures are as a result of what the world is experiencing as uh, climate change. We are still in the uh, dry temperature uh, discussion. Talk to us about where the global temperature is versus what the ideal temperature should be? So already the global temperatures have been warming up. That's the whole issue with climate change. And naturally climate is always changing, but we talk of anthropogenic, which is human induced climate change, which means that human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels, have resulted in an acceleration in the warming. So globally, you're looking at, you know, last year we almost breached the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming mm -hmm. above average, and South Africa is warming at almost double the global average. Sure. So hence we experience some of these extremes because we are warming faster than the global average. So what that essentially means is a warmer climate stores more moisture. A warmer climate also means more energy to drive storms or storm systems. A warmer climate also means higher temperatures and heat waves. And it also means that fires can start and spread more easily, which are some of the things that we are experiencing. And so I take it then that what the people in the Western Cape have been experiencing is part and parcel of this a global warming, which on the one hand will uh, result in very dry vegetation, but on the other end, it brings about the rough seas, for example, that are being experienced in Cape Town. So what is being experienced in Cape Town has been a series of successive cut-off law systems. These are typical uh, in Cape Town at this time of the year. They bring the rain that they receive. The unusual thing this time around is they had them in succession, one after the other. So if you have heavy rainfall, it saturates the soil. Mm. And any further heavy rainfall after that would mean now you are having localized flooding because you've exceeded your drainage and the strong winds and strong gusts. But in the absence of what we call an attribution study, we can't really say that what is happening in, in uh, Cape Town right now is because of climate change. There needs to be a separate study to confirm that. 
But what we can say is that it's generally consistent with the known trends of climate change. Let's then talk about the country's ability to respond to these extreme weather patterns. Do you think that we are either there in terms of uh, this response, particularly looking back to, I think it was uh, 2022, those uh, very severe floods, if not 2023, in KZN, or must the country still build up proper systems in order to be climate resilient? I think from 2022 to date, it's, it has become clear and it's quite clear that we are not adequately prepared because every time we have this inclement weather, it is associated with significant destruction, it is associated with death, destruction. So we are not adequately prepared. And as the president said in his speech today, there is significant investment really that is needed to transition South Africa to become a climate resilient country. And the scale of the investment compared to what the country can afford, there's a huge mismatch, which means we need to bring in significant international climate finance to cover the gap. Because in many systems, we require infrastructure overhauls to redesign our infrastructure, to repurpose our infrastructure. We need significant investments in rehabilitating the natural environment so that it can play its role in protecting the coastline, uh, you know, infrastructure being made climate resilient, training people and government officials in disaster management so that they're able to take proactive action to reduce the impact of these disasters. So by and far, we are not prepared. We are still far off what would be required for us to deal with these disasters. And we don't have the luxury of time just to mention that too. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the element of time because it is part of what the president spoke about today that if the country moves too fast, there is a severe economic impact. Certain sectors of the economy will suffer, but at the same time, if you do not act now, there are implications going into the future. You've prompted the international climate finance, and it reminds me of the Just Energy Transition uh, pledges. These are, I think, the loans that were offered uh, to the country. Where are we as a country in terms of realizing those, or should we perhaps move with caution? So those loans were, were offered, and I think what's important is to note that they are loans. So South Africa would need to repay the loans. So there's the question of whether it is affordable to the economy, given the stagnation in the economy. And also the amount that was provided, about 9.5 billion, is still far below what is needed to finance a just energy transition. Because the just energy transition is not just about new renewable energy power generation. It's also about the communities. How do we diversify the communities that have been reliant on fossil fuel value chains? How do we re-equip and reskill people whose livelihoods were dependent on the core value chain? Mm. So it, it goes beyond just installing renewable energies, but there's the community aspects. There's the part in South Africa of addressing inequalities and poverty and growing unemployment. So there's the money is there, but it's insufficient to match what is there. The affordability also is something that has to be considered. What we are really calling for, and I think what the rest of Africa needs, including South Africa, is grant funding. Mm. Because grant funding and significant grant funding is what could actually tilt the scales and allow for that rapid pace of transition, which is also just, inclusive and equitable. Yeah. Will the international community be amenable to that grant funding versus loans? 
So I think the president also sort of lambasted, uh, you know, politely the international community in terms of, you know, the pledges that are made not always materializing. And so there's that past aspect where pledges have been made, but they've not always materialized. The requirements to access climate finance, it's a issue of huge debate. Uh, there are significant challenges for a lot of countries, including South Africa, to access these funds even when they are available because of the requirements that are put forward. The need for concessionary funding, which could be blended funding in terms of grants and loans, also needs to be negotiated. So I think the international community really needs to come to the party and there has to be also an acknowledgement that you know, everyone keeps saying it that Africa is suffering, but it's only contributing 3% of global emissions. And it has not been the biggest contributor to the problem. So there has to be that acknowledgement and also equally funding both mitigation and adaptation, but through concessionary finance and through supporting local institutions, in-country institutions that can better do and respond to some of these priorities with a sense of local context and local dynamics as opposed to having you know international multilateral entities coming into the space and usually not without you know a, a context of the dynamics of local people in south africa it's a very scary situation professor uh, professor tafata mapaudi uh, is uh, with the university of kwazulu natal's climate change and you heard him say that South Africa is warming at double the speed of the global uh, temperature. That's a very scary thought.